uh, laboratory dealing with electrotechnology and probably the only one uh, laboratory, academic laboratory in Italy dealing with induction heating. Before starting my presentation, my talk about uh, the induction heating of bars and billets, so mass heating uh, of metals, I would like to show you some photos of my laboratory just to present uh, our activities. In our laboratory, we have some uh, uh, industrial uh, scale uh, facilities, uh, like uh, an induction hardening machine, uh, 200 kilowatt rated, that can work from 2 kilohertz up to 10 kilohertz. We have also some uh, uh, radio frequency generators, so we are not dealing all, only with metals, but also with some dielectric materials. In fact, uh, we have a lot of instrumentation uh, to make uh, experiments with microwave, for instance. In this photo, you can see a uh, uh, solid state microwave generator that we use instead of the classical magnetron. Furthermore, we have uh, a vacuum uh, uh, induction heating uh, chamber where we can melt the silicon. In particular, the system is uh, designed to melt and to directional solidificate uh, silicon for photovoltaic applications. Finally, I show the last picture. And uh, this is uh, a system that uh, is uh, designed to the ma for the mass heating of aluminum billets. In this photo, you see the aluminum billet painted in black uh, because uh, uh, we need uh, to know a certain uh, given value of emissivity when we measure temperature. But uh, trust me, the billet is made of, of aluminum. And uh, this system is uh, the topic of the final part of my talk. So let's move to the outline of my talk, of my presentation. Uh, at the beginning, in the first part, we will discuss uh, about the uh, analytical method in order to have uh, some basic quantities uh, to proper design an induction heating system. In particular, we know that uh, nowadays uh, numerical methods are very used for this kind of design and to obtain optimal results. Nevertheless, in my opinion, a designer must, must know the te theory that uh, is behind the induction heating. So we will have a look to some very easy formulas that uh, arise from the analytical solution of uh, uh, electromagnetic and thermal fields. At the end of my presentation, I will uh, present an innovative technique in order to heat uh, uh, high conductive material like aluminum or copper with a uh, new way of induction heating. Instead of having uh, copper and inductor. In this uh, approach, we have a system of permanent magnets that rotate around the billet. But we will see it later. Today, we will talk about the mass seating of uh, uh, metals. That is uh, a thermal process that is required before hot uh, uh, working mechanical working, like forging, forming, extrusion. The main goal of this technology is to obtain a uniform temperature across the radius of the billet. Sometimes along the axis we uh, are required to have specific temperature distribution. But uh, for today, we can uh, assume that uh, the uniform temperature are all along the uh, mass of the billet. This is the result that we want to obtain. We want to have a, a billet heated at the right temperature for the hot mechanical working. On the bottom side of the uh, slide, there are the typical temperature that we have to reach uh, for different uh, technology, technological processes and for different kind of material. Let me say that induction heating is very good when we have to heat uh, metals to a very high temperature because it is a technology that makes use of internal heating sources. 
When we have to heat materials like aluminum that uh, require lower temperature, gas furnaces are very good, a very strong competitor in compare with induction heating. I think that uh, uh, you know everybody who is listening to this webinar have also attended to the webinar presented by Professor Bach and Professor Nake. So you know that uh, the main advantage, advantages of induction heating, like the repeatability of the process, we can have optimal production. Uh, typically, they have a small footprint in our shops, so they use less space in comparison with other furnaces. Uh, we have a, a very uh, good uh, <clears throat> working ambient because we don't burn any fuel. We have a fast process, so we have a very low uh, oxidation and decarbonization of some material like steel. Sometimes there are some disadvantages, in particular in some countries like Italy, the electricity price is very high and makes uh, induction heating uh, uh, very expensive. And uh, uh, sometimes it's quite complex uh, to heat the uh, workpiece of complex shape. And finally, uh, we must take into account that when we design an inductor, this inductor has a specific uh, workpiece to heat. So we need to change the inductor when we change the workpiece. But we will see this aspect very soon. The traditional uh, study of induction heating is uh, carried out on a very simple, simple geometrical uh, configuration. We consider now only cylindrical billet heated by a cylindrical external inductor. In this uh, uh, geometrical configuration, we can uh, easily integrate uh, the uh, uh, differential equation that describe electromagnetic field in the space. The main solution of this uh, analytical uh, treatment is the calculation of the induced power in the load. The induced power in the load depends on the square value of the intensity of the magnetic field on the external surface of the billet, HE. It depends on the material properties of the billet, in particular the resistivity. It depends on the volume of the billet, 2P by R by L. I'm sorry, it is a mistake here, the length of the billet. And it depends on the skin depth, delta, that is on the bottom side of the ratio. But, more, but the more import, most important parameter is M, that is uh, describing a dimensionless quantity uh, or the ratio between the external radius of the billet and the value of the skin depth. Dimensionless quantities are very useful in order to have uh, a general description of this kind of process. In particular, the induced power depends on a parameter P that is a function of this ratio. In this um, graphic, we have the value of P that is uh, directly linked to the value of the power that we, we can transfer to the billet. Of course, we want to maximize the power that we want to transfer to the billet. And that means that the M parameter must be at least 2 and an half or 3. If this value is, is smaller than 3, we have a bad coupling between the inductor and the billet. Typically, uh, in order to increase the M, that depends on the ratio between the radius and the skin depth, we have to increase the frequency. So for a small workpiece, when the R is small, we need to have small skin depth, and we need to increase the efficiency in order to achieve a value of M at least 2 and a half. 
The lexical efficiency depends also on the choice of the inductor. Here we can imagine an induction heating system like a transformer with the secondary turn short circuit. In this case, it's quite easy to simplify the equivalent circuit of a transformer into a series uh, circuit where a, a resistance that describes the resistance of the inductor and the resistance that describes the resistance of the load are series connected. So they have the same intensity of current E carried in. The electrical efficiency of this process so can be calculated as the ratio between the useful power, the power that is uh, induced inside the billet, and the sum of the useful power and the losses that we have in the inductor copper. In other words, the efficiency is uh, higher when we can reduce the value of the equivalent resistance of the inductor. Also, this value depends on the frequency that we have chosen. Now, we don't consider the M parameter like the ratio between the radius and the skin depth. In this case, the M parameter is defined between the thickness of the copper tube and the skin depth inside the uh, inside the copper at the given frequency. Also, this value depends on a parameter A, in this case, it's named AE, that is a function of M. Of course, we want to minimize the power inside the inductor, the power losses. And this uh, uh, curve has a minimum when the ratio between the, the thickness of the copter and the skin depth is equal to P by 2. So the simple rule in order to calculate the good thickness of the copper is to multiply by 1 and an alpha the value of, this, of the skin depth inside the copper. This is the reason because when we have a low frequency, we need to use a speci special uh, copper uh, cross-section. On the upper part, there is uh, the classical inductor uh, used for low frequency application, where we don't have a copper tube, but uh, a massive uh, layer of copper that is cooled with an external tube uh, welded on the copper itself. A tiger frequency the skin depth become lower, and the thickness of the copper can be just some millimeters. In this case, it's quite easy to bend the copper in order to create the inductor, and typically we use a copper tube that can be uh, cooled down by water inside of the tube. In this slide, we present the theoretical maximum efficiency that we can achieve using induction heating. The, the first formula uh, is still depending on uh, the value of M parameter. So on the value of the frequency depends uh, the parameter A and the parameter P. But let's assume that we have chosen the frequency in a proper way and that we have chosen the thickness of the copper in a proper way. In this case, the maximum efficiency that we can reach depends only on the rho E, that is the resistivity of the copper, of the inductor, the resistivity of the material, and the permeability of the material. This is the reason why for magnetic steel that have a significant value of the permeability, we can achieve very high efficiency of the process is the A curve on the uh, right side of the slide. With uh, steel, we can reach, uh, before, uh, below Curie point, uh, efficiency higher than 80 or 90 percent. But when we have to hit materials that have a very good uh, electrical conductivity, so a very low electrical resistivity, 
this efficiency becomes much lower. In particular, for uh, materials that have no magnetic properties, so the relative permeability mu is equal to 1, and uh, the resistivity is this, almost the same of uh, the copper, we can reach efficiency of about 50%. The maximum efficiency depends also on a ratio that is alpha, that is the ratio between the internal radius of the inductor and the external radius of the load. This is the reason why we cannot use the same inductor for various uh, dimensions of the billet, because we need to have this value alpha as low as possible. In this slide, there are the typical cross section of our system. In the central part, we have the billet. We have some uh, uh, rays that drive the billet movement inside the inductor. We have a thermal insulator, typically made of uh, concrete. And uh, the black line describes the external inductor. Typically, we have the same boxes with inductor where the billet is uh, positioned and heated in a uh, um, steady process. But sometimes uh, the billet are moved inside this inductor in order to have a continuous heating of a moving billet. Of course, we cannot use this inductor for it, small diameter billets. Typically, the value of alpha, that is the ratio between the inner radius of the inductor and the external radius of the billet, are depending also on the actual diameter or radius of the billet. So the higher is the diameter of the billet, the lowest can be this ratio. So we have less thermal insulator between the workpiece and the inductor for biggest billet. Now uh, we have to remember that uh, in induction heating technology, in electric technologies, we are not uh, dealing only with electromagnetic fields, but also thermal fields as a very important role. Before, all the solutions that I presented are derived by integration of the Maxwell equation. In this case, thermal, uh, the thermal field, the temperature field, can be calculated by integrating the Fourier equation. In this equation, we have theta, that is the temperature. We have uh, uh, the material properties, in particular for the thermal process, for the thermal uh, problem are very important, the specific heat, the material density, and the thermal conductivity. A more, maybe the most important parameter is the one called thermal diffusivity. That is the ratio between the thermal con conductivity and the uh, volumetric specific heat. The solution of this equation is very complex. I give you just some uh, uh, results that you can uh, obtain by this integration. The first uh, solution that I propose is a solution where we impose a certain uh, external temperature on the billet, or in mathematical terms, we are imposing a boundary condition of temperature on the external surface, and we want to see the time that is required in order to have a uniform distribution of temperature. This solution is very useful for some application of mass heating, because in order to have fast process, we uh, have uh, the possibility to equalize temperature, uh, maintaining the external temperature at a, a given value. Also for this solution, we resort to dimensionless quantities. They are very useful because the solution is independent on the specific geometry that we have. In particular, we introduce a dimensionless, dimensionless radius, that is the ratio between the actual position on the cross-section, r, small r, 
and the external radius of the billet, and a dimensional time, tau, that is uh, uh, depending on thermal diffusivity and the, radius, uh, the square value of the radius of the billet, and then a dimensional temperature. This graphic tells us that, uh, for instance, uh, after a dimensionless time tau equals to 0 0.3, that means uh, a time that is depending on the square value of the radius and uh, divided by the thermal diffusivity, the temperature dif difference between the surface where C is equal to 1 and the axis where C is equal to 0 is about 30%. Of course, it's very interesting to notice that the, this choice of dimensionless quantity gives us a very reasonable result. For instance, the time that I have to wait, the real time in seconds, is much bigger for bigger radius of the billet and becomes smaller when the thermal diffusivity is very high. Now the solution becomes much more complex when we deal with induction heating and we can imagine to have a surface power density on the external part of the billet. But we can simplify this formula just uh, neglecting the initial part and using this very basic and easy formula that is valid when the temperature rise is almost constant. So temperature versus time has a constant slope of uh, growth. This is the case when we heat uh, uh, by induction a linear material like aluminum. The solution of this equation gives us some uh, basic formula, very easy formula, in order to have uh, a preliminary evaluation of the power per unit of length and uh, the heating time that is required in order to have a certain temperature difference epsilon between the surface and the axis. Let's have a look to the second formula, the one describing the uh, heating time required for the process. It looks very complex, but if we neglect the term that uh, corrects the formula as a function of m, it's a simple energy balance that is described the electric energy supplied to the billet, P by the time, and the thermal energy that is uh, stored inside the billet because it has reached the external temperature, theta S. <coughs> Sorry. The same quantities can be also used in order to have the length lambda of a plant that is supposed to have a certain production rate M. So these formulas are very easy and uh, allow us a preliminary evaluation of the basic quantity of our receipt, that is uh, time and power. These formulas are valid when you apply, when you use linear material like uh, aluminum, copper, but when you heat uh, uh, ferromagnetic material, ferrous metals, uh, the thermal transient are not uh, uh, characterized by the constant growth of temperature versus time. In this uh, picture, we have the typical behavior of the heating of a uh, uh, ferromagnetic billet. When the material is below Curie point, we have very fast heating and the slope uh, uh, of the temperature is very high. When, and also in this period, when the, magnet, the material is uh, magnetic, we have also very high temperature differences between the surface and the axis. When uh, the uh, Curie point has been passed, the slope of temperature growth becomes much slower and also temperature differences becomes, very, becomes smaller. This is valid for, uh, uh, for a heating carried out in to inside a single inductor. So with constant frequency, a constant magnetic field on the surface. 
This behavior is uh, due to the material properties behavior versus temperature. In particular, we have the, the electrical resistivity that is uh, very strongly between uh, the uh, room temperature and the QD point that is about 760 degrees. The right curve is the number three. So for uh, uh, carbon steel, for instance, uh, the resistivity is varying from 20 micron centimeter up to about uh, uh, 100 micron centimeter. When the QD point has been passed, the slope becomes much smaller and uh, the resistivity varies from the value at the QD point, about 100 micron centimeter, to 120 micron centimeter when the temperature is 1,200 degrees. Furthermore, uh, the magnetic behavior be, is nonlinear, so it depends on the actual field applied to the workpiece. And uh, here in this uh, picture, we have the permeability of room temperature as a function of the uh, magnetic field on the surface for different content of carbon inside the steel, inside of the steel. Also, magnetic permeability depends on temperature. And it's very well known that when a Curie point has been reached, the material becomes uh, non-magnetic. This behavior can be um, summarized with this slide. The very thick uh, curve is describing the induced power in the billet. So at the beginning, we have a power that increases and is very high. Then it starts to decrease when up to the QD point. After the QD point has been reached, the power is almost constant. The previous analytical formula can be applied also for this case. I don't want to bore you too much with all these formulas. But the basic idea is that we can split the thermal process into two steps. The first step is below Curie point, and is named A. And the second step is after Curie point, is named B. Typical values of resistivity and permeability allow us to say that the ratio between the M value, the dimensionless radius M, that is the most important parameter in induction heating, is uh, 10 times higher when uh, uh, the Curie point has not been reached. So MA before Curie is 10 or 20 times bigger than the 20, I'm sorry, 20 times bigger than the value of M after the Curie point. We have uh, the possibility to calculate also ratio of the specific power induced in the billet. But the main result is that the heating time can be calculated in making this hypothesis. The material has the properties after Curie, so non-magnetic material. We can calculate a T0 start, that is the longest time in the diagram, considering constant properties after Curie. This time is more or less two times bigger than the real time that we need to achieve the process. The previous formula gives us uh, the final temperature um, required with a certain temperature difference between the surface and the axis. But we have to think uh, that uh, after the heating, there is uh, always uh, some delay time before uh, the uh, mechanical process for handing the billet from the inductor to the extruder, for instance. Also resorting to the analytical solution of uh, uh, thermal fields, we can expect uh, the time that is required to reduce the temperature difference to 30% or to 10% of the initial time. The formula is, again, very easy, even if uh, the treatment, uh, analytical treatment is very complex. For instance, if we want to reduce uh, the temperature difference to the 30% of the initial value, 
you have to apply a time that is equal to 0, 75, multiply by the radius of the billet, and divide by the thermal diffusivity value. Of course, this uh, uh, soaking time becomes much bigger for bigger billets, that is quite clear, and is uh, uh, bigger for material that have a small value of thermal diffusivity. We can also use uh, this soaking time in order to have a fast process uh, in heating, in mass heating billets. The first process uh, is uh, a standard process. So we have calculated the heating time with the formula that I've shown before. And we want to have, at the end of the process, a uh, temperature difference between the surface and the ambient equal to 6% of the external temperature. In this case, the heating process lasts about 60 seconds. We can make the same process allowing a bigger temperature difference at the end of the heating between the external part of the surface and the axis. And then uh, uh, have a soaking time for obtaining the same temperature dif difference that we have in the previous example. The big difference here is that the total heating time to achieve the same performance, the same goal, is now 50% less in comparison with the first example. So now the process takes only 30 seconds instead of 60. This is very important because uh, thermal uh, efficiency has a very big role in our process. Of course, I reach the same te standard temperature, so thermal losses from the surface uh, are about uh, uh, 60 watt per uh, square centimeter. But in the first process, uh, the time is 60 seconds. In the second process, we reach uh, almost the same value of the losses because we reach the same temperature, but the time is 50% less. The energy that I lose depends on the integral of the losses, so it depends on time. So having a faster process means that we can save energy. We can have less thermal losses. For all these reasons, we can say that the proper choice of the frequency depends on electrical efficiency, so we need to have an M value at least equal to 2.5, but also depends on thermal efficiency. So we cannot use too high value of M, because when the M value is too high, we have a surface heating, and the thermal diffusivity takes more time in order to have a uniform temperature distribution. So I draw some conclusion of this first part. And uh, let me say that uh, nowadays we can optimize uh, resorting to numerical modeling, uh, this kind of process, in a very fine way. Nevertheless, uh, this knowledge is very important to have uh, a basic idea of the mm, main quantities of the process. In this picture, there is uh, an example of batch uh, heater with three inductors. And each inductor is designed for a specific pro material properties. So uh, it has a different frequency and different value of the external field in order to have the optimal value of M parameter for the different uh, thermal characteristic and electromagnetic characteristic of the material. Other process, other machine, work in a continuous way where several inductors are crossed by, the, uh, by a moving billet. In this case, we have a continuous through heating of billets. We have to take uh, care about the first and the last billet because uh, they are suffering of edge effect and probably they will be overheated in our system.
So the conclusion is that we have uh, some basic uh, formula that allow us uh, a preliminary design of our system. And we must respect uh, the value of M and the value of the copper thickness in order to achieve a good efficiency of the process. Now I want to show very briefly an innovative way to make induction with uh, a very good uh, electrical conductor materials like aluminum. As I stated at the beginning, when we heat by induction aluminum, we can reach efficiency very low, about 50%. With this approach, we transform mechanical energy supplied by a motor into thermal energy by means of a motional induction. The first, pre the first uh, proposal was made some years ago by some uh, Norwegian researcher, and the principle is that a rotating billet um, placed inside a DC magnetic field produced by a superconductive coil. Uh, a variation of this approach has been proposed using a system of permanent magnets that are installed in the inner part of a, of a steel rotor. And this magnet with the rotor rotate around the billet that is kept fixed in that position. In any way, we transform mechanical energy into thermal energy. So the efficiency of this process depends on the efficiency of the motor drive mostly. Instead of 50%, we can reach much higher value. Uh, the same formulas that we have uh, calculated for traditional induction heating can be applied also in this uh, process. Let me say that the main difference is that uh, the skin depth, in this case called diffusion length, is not anymore depending on the frequency of magnetic field, but it's depending on the angular velocity in radians per second, that uh, is the velocity, the rotational velocity, of the billet inside the magnetic field. And it's also very nice to see that uh, almost all the formulas that you can derive for the uh, classical induction heating can be applied also to this kind of process. OK, skip this image because I'm running out of time. Let me say that this uh, system is a, has a lot of advantages in comparison with traditional induction heating. For instance, we don't need to have a water cooling system and a chiller to uh, freeze the inductor during the process. Furthermore, in comparison with the proposal where uh, superconductive coils are used uh, to produce a DC magnetic field, uh, using permanent magnets allow us to modify the number of magnetic poles. And in this way, we can uh, uh, modify also the equivalent velocity of the magnetic field around the billet in order to achieve the best value of the magnetic parameter M. In this photo, there is uh, the first prototype that we have realized in our laboratory, and it is a machine able to heat uh, 500 millimeter aluminum billet, uh, 200 millimeter diameter. The weight is about 42 kilos. And uh, we achieved very good results because uh, the efficiency of the process was about 50%. Finally, I'll show you the latest uh, research about this uh, application, and we want to have a taper heating of the billet. A taper heating is a heating where the head of the billet has a higher temperature in comparison with the ending part. This is required when we want to make an isothermal extrusion of the billet. In fact, the die where you press the billet becomes hotter during the process process for friction. So in order to have isothermal process, we need to have the head of the billet, the first part of the billet uh, that is extruded at a higher temperature in comparison to the end. With our system, we can do also this kind of process. OK, um, just have a look to the requirements. And we want uh, the head of the billet at 500 degree, and the end of the billet at 430 degree. In order to achieve this, we make an induction system uh, that, uh, is, uh, that comprises several rotors. Each rotor hits a specific part of the billet. Uh, 
and each rotor can rotate at different velocities. Regulating the velocity, I regulate uh, the uh, induced power in the billet, and uh, as a consequence, I can obtain a tapered temperature distribution along the axis. Finally, the idea is also to rotate uh, each uh, module in opposite direction. In this way, I can uh, cancel or significantly um, reduce the net torque that is acting to the billet. This is the process. After 45 seconds, we work with all the rotors. In the second part, we use only two rotors to overheat the head of the billet. And the final step is a heating, is a soaking time in order to have a uniform temperature distribution across the radius. Okay, this is all. There's just a photo of the final industrial machine that we have realized. It's a 240 kilowatt system for the taper heating of aluminum billets. In this system, we achieve a very good efficiency because the value, measured value of the efficiency was 0.5%.